Welcome to the Best Music Podcast with Dan Spencer. My name is Dan, and today we're taking a special look to understand what are the lost tapes of the 27 Club and how and why they were made. Let's take a quick listen to one of the songs. Now, like me, your first thought might be, well, this sounds sort of like a Jimi Hendrix song, but I don't think I've heard this one before, and you'd be right. So essentially, what you just listened to is a compilation of many different Jimi Hendrix songs where two AIs and a cover band singer create this song. You can find links to all the songs in the Lost Tapes of the 27 Club project in the video description below or if you are on audio in the show notes give them a quick listen and then come back and we'll continue on so let's talk a little bit about how these songs got made and why they needed to use two separate ai's to create the songs the first ai which we'll call the music ai listened to a whole bunch of songs from one of the artists in the 27 Club. Let's use Jimi Hendrix as an example. So they fed this AI 20, 30, 40 songs that Jimi Hendrix has written and recorded. And the AI learned from listening to those songs about how Jimi Hendrix as a writer and also the Jimi Hendrix experience as a group approached rhythm, approached melody, harmony, all these components that come together to create a song. After the AI listened to all these songs, it said, okay, I think I got a pretty solid idea of what Jimi Hendrix and what's the Jimi Hendrix experience is. And then it was able to generate a brand new song using the elements and everything it had learned from listening to all those Jimi Hendrix and Jimi Hendrix experience songs before. Now, the music AI could not actually detect lyrics, which are the words that are sung or spoken over a song. So the music AI was able to generate drums, bass, guitar, and a vocal melody, but without the actual lyrics to the song. This is where our second AI is going to come in. The second AI, which we will call the Lyric AI, was fed all of the lyrics for the songs that the music AI was given. So we had 20, 30, 40 music songs fed to the music AI, and that's how it was able to create the music. For the Lyric AI, we fed it 20, 30, 40 lyric sheets. And then it learned from the style of the lyrics and then was able to create a brand new set of lyrics in the style of Jimi Hendrix. Now, what was very interesting is to create a process where the lyric AI would actually match the lyrics up to the melody that the music AI had created. As a third step of the process, Over the Bridge brought in a cover band singer to sing the melody that the music AI had created coupled with the lyrics that the lyric AI had created to tie the whole thing together and really give the song an authentic feel because cover band singers spend a lot of their time getting very precise about the way they mimic or channel the spirit of an artist's performance. As a last step, an audio engineer took the music, so the drums, bass, guitar from the music AI, took the performance of the cover band singer using the melody from the music AI and the lyrics from the lyric AI, and mixed it all together to create a brand new song, creating the lost tapes of the 27 Club. So what is the 27 Club? 
The 27 Club is a group of musicians who all passed away at the age of 27. This includes Janis Joplin, Amy Winehouse, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, and Kurt Cobain. With all these high profile and very well known musicians passing away at the age of 27, this gave rise to the myth and the creation of the 27 Club. Since many members of the 27 Club struggled publicly with mental health and Over the Bridge is an organization dedicated to helping musicians and music industry workers with their mental health, this project seemed like a perfect fit. Over the Bridge wanted to create this project to raise awareness about mental health not only for musicians but also music industry workers. Here are some facts. 71.1% of musicians experience anxiety or a panic attack at some point in their career. 68.5% of musicians experience depression. Over the Bridge wanted to raise awareness about these facts and about musicians and music industry workers' mental health in general by creating these songs and this project. Since August 2017, Over the Bridge has educated, trained, and emotionally supported over 2,000 musicians and members of the music industry. I sat down with founding member and executive director Ace Piva to understand more about the lost tapes of the 27 Club and to hear about what Over the Bridge is doing right now. Ace Piva is a certified addictions worker and knows the ins and outs of the road and its pressures and struggles working as a musician, stage manager, and tour manager. Ace's goals are to help break the stigmas associated with mental illness through education, awareness, resources, and support for musicians, crew, and entertainment professionals. Ace, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do this. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. So how was this AI developed? Is this something that you guys made custom for this project or was this something that already existed out in the world? Uh, do you mean the technology or the songs? Well, you fed a bunch of hooks and lyrics and different instruments parts into an AI that then helped create the song. So the actual AI, was that created specifically for this project? Uh, the, the songs were, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but the technology is an open source uh, thing that's out there ran by Google. It's actually called Magenta and anybody has access to it. So, When you were trying to take different parts of each song, were you selective about which hooks, which vocal lines you were feeding into the algorithm to try and steer the result in a certain way? Well, that's the, we weren't trying to steer it in any way. That was all the AI software doing its thing. You know, we chose artists that had large catalogs, right? So we, depending on the artists, you know, we, it was be tw between 10 and 20 songs, uh, just so the AI had enough data to, I guess, be influenced by, uh, you know, uh, just like, uh, a, an artist would be influenced from, you know, listening to the radio or anything else, right? We just gave it a lot to choose from. And we didn't try and manipulate it in any way to sound like a specific artist or anything like that. That's just what came out. Uh, you know, uh, however, with the lyrics, because there was two programs, one did the music and one did the lyrics. So the only tricky part was selecting, uh, uh, lines that had similar syllables to what the AI music part of it spat out, right? So because at the end we did have people sing on it, like it that like that was that was human, right? But as far as they, you know, uh, we, the people that we selected, they were part of. Uh, cover bands or uh, tribute artists and all that. So that they're, they're very familiar with the artists' like cadence and, and, and things like that. But the melodies and the hooks themselves, that was all AI written. 
you know, and, but during the initial like demo phases, kind of what came out of it was you had the music and that was very clear, but the, the vocal tracks over that kind of sounded like bad digital MP3 downloads, hmm. right? So it was a bunch of mumbling and jumbling because the lyrics weren't put into there, right? Because there was two separate, uh, programs that, that did their, you know, the music and, and the lyric, uh, programs. So, yeah. So those were, uh, unusable, you know, the, the original. So, you know, the, our, our team had took out the, the, the AI, I guess, melodies, you know, just, just for more clarification and had the person redo it to the best of their ability. So when you're feeding these songs into the AI, did you need to break down and try and isolate the different instruments for the AI to understand the different parts? Or was it able to figure out this is what a guitar does, this is what drums do? Because I wasn't the one who personally did it from my understandings. They just fed the, the, the wow. songs in. <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, chorus, pre-chorus or anything like that. In fact, you know, there was no human element as to the structure of the songs from verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus, end, you know, that, that was not, and it had nothing to do with, with people. That was all the AI. That's incredible. That, yeah. that, that is next level. Cool. So out of everyone that is in the 27 club, uh, why did you pick these particular artists? Uh, because of the size of their catalog, you know, because if you go back and you have artists like Robert Johnson, you know, uh, you know, he, he only has 10, 10, 15 songs to, to choose from and the quality is very low. So, you know, the artists that, that were chosen were because of the, the length of their catalogs as well as the clarity uh, of, of it as well. Cause when you go back too far, you know, that the quality just gets you know, technology just wasn't there. What was the process like in terms of mixing and mastering the output from the AI? Uh, from my understandings, it was, it would be very similar to uh, a a anything else, right? Actually, from my understanding, it was probably a little simpler because it already sort of came out pr pretty darn close. Right. So it was just a little bit tweaking here and there from my understanding. Yeah. So getting someone else to come in and sing the vocals for the songs, like you mentioned, it was really important because the AI wasn't quite able to do the two things at once in terms of creating a musical thing and then also creating something lyrically that was going to make sense melodically over what was happening. So you take the pre established melody of the AI and then you have the cover band essentially mm -hmm. sing that melody with words that were also taken from the lyrics of those songs put into a second ai that the second ai generated right right so that is absolutely fascinating next level <laughs> definitely can you talk a little bit about the uh studies you're doing with canadian uh universities around mental health in the music industry yeah, you know, we're at a, an exciting uh, spot with that. Uh, we've been working on this for a little while. Uh, I, it kind of sort of came from an article that I read a couple of years ago where it talked about a thing called post-performance depression, <laughs> right? And and I, I just thought it was so intriguing. It was the first time that phrase, I had seen that phrase. As soon as I've seen it, I go, as a touring you know, a, t a touring musician back in the day. And then even still, like I've been a, a tour manager for the past 14 years and I continue to be so, you know, I understood the get home after a show or after a long tour and not feeling right. There's an adjustment period, you know, uh, because it takes two different uh, sets of skills uh to manage both sides of, of the life, the on road life and at home life. Right. And there's a lot of things that I noticed well before I, I read this article that I was, that I was missing. 
you know, I lost a lot of connections with, with my friends because you're gone all the time. And eventually when you say, Hey, sorry, I'm not around to come hang out. People just stop calling, you know, it's just human nature. You know, if you keep going to McDonald's for the McRib and they don't have the McRib anymore. Well, you're not going there for the McRib, right? <laughs> so, so that, that's kind of what happens. So then I, I had happened to talk to a neighbor of mine who's a professor at McMaster University about this. And he, he was a part of a few research projects before and he just pointed me in the right direction on how, what I needed to do. So we end up uh, partnering up with McMaster University uh, <clears throat> because, because I'm, I am not a researcher by, by trade, you know, G- give me a tour book and tell, you know, tell me where <laughs> I need to go with the band. Hey, I'll make that come in under budget. There's no problem there. Right? But, but research just wasn't in my wheelhouse. So it did take me some time of educating myself how the process of doing a research project goes. So, and I needed the guidelines by the professionals to make sure I stood in those guidelines. So I developed this, this questionnaire that, that went out. We had over 300 musicians participate in it. And what it does is it talks about, uh, how people feel after shows, whether it's positive, negative, high emotion, low emotion. And with in where when wherever they fell in that spectrum, how do they manage those feelings? Right. So it has taken us a, a little bit to get to this point, and we are at the final. We just got the the final write up from our uh, data analyzers, a research team from Georgian College, uh, which is uh, just north of Toronto, and they've been fantastic, and they've just. So right now we're in the process of, of like, what story do we want to tell with our findings? So that process is, is, is happening right now. And hopefully in the next few months, we'll, we'll be able to deliver our, our findings, you know, both the positive and negative. Uh, and I don't want to, I, I want to focus on both because if, if I said, Hey, you know, playing music is all bad. Oh, I, I think that's a crock. Because people keep doing it. You know, people have been playing for years. If people didn't enjoy doing something, then they wouldn't be doing it. You know, and also, and as well as music is such an emotional occupation. You know, it's, a, it's not just for the listener, but for the, but for the performers. You know, it's, it's highs and lows and, and uh, betting on yourself, you know, and due to pop, you know, pop, popular culture, betting on yourself. Not everyone's in favor for it. You know what I mean? You know, especially the old school thinkers, you know, you want to get that solid job, get, get the, you know, get the pension, get the, uh, in the, the insurance and all that stuff. Right. And where musicians really, they bet on themselves and there's consequences to that, both positive and negative, you know, and for a musician, are you happy playing at a coffee house? Maybe yes, maybe, maybe that's cool, you know, or is, does your talent take it to the arena level? And even if you make it to the arena level, that doesn't mean you're happy. Like, you know, what, what's your spot? Are you the leader of the band? Are you comfortable? Are you a backing guy in the band? Are you comfortable in that position? Yes or no? Or do you want the fame and the fortune? And if yes, do you know what to do with it when you get it? You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of people in this world that they're so used to the struggle that when they win, it freaks them out. <laughs> like, and, and that's just human nature because we are, there's no amount of training or warning that really prepares for someone for that statue of celebrity. If, if you're lucky enough to get that, you know, like we see examples like Justin Bieber, you know, who, you know, and this is pure speculation and anecdotal, in my opinion, only. But, you know, you hear stories of like Justin Bieber who go out there and, you know, he buys an expensive car and then he, you know, wraps it around a pole or something like that. Right. And it's usually kind of only a few months after a little tour. Right. Hmm. Right. Like, it's, so, so 
what is it? And this is my speculation only, you know, is that while well, you're on tour, you have all these emotional highs, right? And you go out there and now the tour is over and now your serotonin and dopamine level have to, like, how are you managing? Are you chasing after it? <laughs> I, I, I've never been in a car that goes 300 miles an hour, but I can, I can only imagine the, the excitement that that would bring, right? Is it a similar stage to singing to 30, 40,000 people a night? You know, are they trying to recreate those dopamine and serotonin rushes? But while they do that, you know, and now, you know, with, you know, COVID and other things, you know, Bieber over the last couple of years, I don't think he's been on tour as much. He hasn't had a, a world tour, but also with that, he's, he's, you know, through his social media, it seems like he's calm things down a little bit you know he's gotten married you know he, he's he's done a, a few things to 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 normalize a, a lifestyle for him as opposed to being on the road where you're you're up and down you know your your energy level is always high so has time away from touring helped him maybe you know but but he's not doing the same things he was in the past Right. So, you know, and like I said, that's all speculation. I hope to have that conversation with him one day. Absolutely. And I think it's also an interesting prospect to consider what brings someone into that lifestyle in the first place. Like the very thing that brings you to want that or to embrace that and to embrace the intention to want to perform. What are those implications on well, depression and things like that? I think that's an interesting part, too. Well, you know, you had, you had mentioned some of those stats earlier. Yeah. Right. You know, 71% of artists, uh, feel anxiety, you know, and, and panic attacks and 68.5% experience depression. Right. And that is a huge population within, within amongst performers. Mm. Right. So my, my anecdotal speculation on this is, you know, is, is that in the last couple, okay, before I get into that, uh, over the last couple of years, five, seven, eight years, music therapy has gotten very popular, right? Everyone's like, oh, I'll go to music therapy. But why, why music therapy, right? Well, because it elicits those dopamine floods, it's creative, it's an output, right? So why do, and what is emotional output? You know, and if you go to any sort of like rehab program or mental health program, they say journaling is a massive tool to use. What's right music? You're, 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 you're journaling with your lyrics, you're journaling with your wrist, you're journaling with your rhythms and beats. You know, punk rock takes something aggressive, right? So it's going more, t more times than that, very aggressive sort of lyric content, you, you know, uh, and so music gives people that emotional outlet for their struggles, as well as a place to celebrate their wins. Either, either way on the spectrum, it's emotion. So when you have emotion to express, where's a great acceptable way to do it? You could be angry at the world and, you know, commit crimes. Or you, if you happen to be a little bit more right side brain, you know, right leaning towards the right side of your brain, might end up on the creative spectrum of things, huh. right? So it's emotional outlet. And then that stuff is great. The right process is very helpful for people, you know, hence music therapy. But when the business size and the outside expectations of Okay, if you're spending 10 hours a week doing this or 40 hours a week, you know, like a regular job, you start getting parents going to be like, so are you making any money off of this yet? You know, are you able to pay your bills? You know, uh, it, it, are you getting a pension out of this? You know, you got health insurance? Like these are real concerns to have at, as a functioning human being, right? And Meanwhile, the artist is like, without, they don't say this, or actually a lot of artists say, hey, you don't understand. That, that's the common comment. Return, well, you just don't understand, and then everyone storms off and everyone's all pissy, right? 
But what they don't understand is that in the person's like, you're, you're right. I don't understand. What is it? Right. And, but usually there's some sort of communication block in there and no one ever figures out you, what you don't understand means. Well, what that means is that I'm going through a lot of emotional stuff and this gives me my outlet to feel normal. Right. But people don't look at it as a therapy tool uh, only up until the last couple of, a couple of years. You know, people start putting on these outside expectations. So, okay, so now you start doing shows and you have to, you know, who, who's booking the show, who's making the posters, who's putting them up, or nowadays you, you just post them up online, no one does physical postering any, a, anymore, you know what I mean? I was, I was a kid on a pair of rollerblades going right in, the, <laughs> you know, in, in the middle of the winter getting chased by the cops because I'm putting posters up on public whatever, you know, but that's what it used to be. It's not so much anymore. But but still there's these expectations of promoting the show. And then how many people are you getting? How how much money, how much revenue is that going to turn into? Right? And there's the whole de- business development side. And for it to be developing a, a business, you need to be a little bit more business savvy, which is the left side of the brain. Right? So which a lot of artists aren't very good at, right? And as well as we got to take into consideration their age, right? It's usually young people who keep going, you know, who, who develop their, their skills as a songwriter as they get older. But our brains aren't fully developed until the ages of 25 or 26. So to be able to manage both the creative side and the business side before that, that is a hell of a lot of pressure on someone who's just trying to manage their mental health. So Ace, do you see that that 70% experiencing anxiety, do you feel, and again, this is all speculation at this point, and I'd love yeah. to see, I'd love to see a future study perhaps on something like this, but like, well, well that, 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 those facts, there was a study out of the UK from organizations called musicians help, help, uh, and there's a full, if, if you do a quick research on those, there's a full study that comes along with those numbers. So those numbers aren't taken from thin air. So, but yeah. So with those numbers, do you think that it's the 70% anxiety? Do you think that that's a result of the personality type that gets attracted to music? Or do you think that that 70% is a result of this pressure cooker as you just described it? Yeah, you know, according to, to to that study, which is actually called "Can Music Make you Sick," is the name of the study, and uh, through their findings, it is the the pressure from the outside. <laughs> Fascinating, uh, Ace. Do you have any other plans for more studies around musicians' mental health, anything like that? Yeah, you know, we are in early discussion about that. And, you know, uh, I would love to really do one, the same sort of study, but focus on the musicians. Uh, I mean, sorry, sorry, uh, to focus on the road crew. Mm. You know, uh, because that is a, you know, uh, that is a massive population that has a lot of the similar struggles, but are still in a slightly different position than the artists. You know what I mean? But they still, you know, their home away, their life, their life work balance is, you know, non-existent because you're either on the road 100% of the time or at the, at home 100% of the time. And it takes very different skills to manage both, both of those lifestyles. And there's a transition period. So not only, not only do we want to say, hey, here's our findings, but also once we focus in on and determine what the problems are, come up with solutions, you know, and that's going to come from a, a large community discussions, you know, because what works for me ain't going to work for someone else and vice versa, or maybe some of it will and some of it won't because as, as unique as people are, so are the solutions. So the best things we could say, is like, here, here are the suggestions I've been given back from our community members. Maybe some of them will work for you. You know, it does get frustrating, you know, especially if we're struggling to find new things. You know, I've tried five or six things. Uh, I've given up, you know, but that's where 
the strength of an understanding community who understands your struggles really comes in to to be uh, a support team to help us get to that next phase of life that we hope will be something that people are happier with and satisfied with. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it takes a village, you know what I mean? And, uh, that is what over the bridge is, is, has done. We, we have a community, an online community of over 1200 musicians and, and roadies and stuff who have, you know, not just mental health in common, but the lifestyle, right? And one thing that's very interesting about music that not a lot of other industries have, you know, is, is the amount of influence that we have, right? And this doesn't go as a uh, quote unquote industry because we got to remember there's people behind the industry, right? So I think, uh, the term industry is just, uh, uh, is, is just, a faceless shield that people like to use because if you don't give something a face, then it's, it's easy just to blame. But the reality is that there's humans behind this industry. And when we work together, we, and we open up and we communicate, you know, no matter how scary it is, uh, we will find that there are people who share our compassion, share our experiences, Therefore, feeling that we are not alone in, in these battles, and they are there to lift each other up, you know, and have a positive effect on each other, which in terms has a positive effect on our families, and our friends, and it's and it's just a wild sort of synergy. But what I was sorry, I went off on a tangent there for a sec. But the music industry has this unique power of creating cultures mm. each each style of music whether death metal jazz opera hip-hop funk you know r&b dirty underground uh hip-hop whatever it may be they all follow a certain uh uni uniform to lifestyle lifestyle mannerisms that makes them feel connected to one another, you know, because you got Jay Z and his clothing brand, you know, and uh, you know, then you got fans of his music, and then you have, you know, people who look towards music for life advice, you know, whether it be love advice, heartbreak advice, or maybe it's not no advice at all, just a, a common understanding that I've had my heart broken, you know, but put into a language that I understand. There are billions of songs about heartbreak, but every every once in a while, there's only one that speaks to what speaks to us more than any others, and each person has a different song, and unlike and, and, and that's just an impact that no other industry truly has on people's personal lives. So if our goal here is to influence the influencers, so they can influence their cultures, you know we have culture makers and. What, what, what a what a wild uh, and exciting thing to be a part of. Incredible. Ace Piva and Over the Bridge, a catalyst for positive change. Hoping to see those <laughs> ripples. Join the online communities. Uh, Ace, those are all my questions for you. Do you have anything you'd like to add before we go? Yeah, if you are a member of the music community, whether you're on or off stage and need the support, Find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and our handles are at OTB Nonprofit, or find us on our uh, website, overthebridge.org. And we do have, in addition to our online peer support communities, we host two Zoom groups a week that's, uh, that has uh, musicians and roadies involved uh, to come and express their feelings and their thoughts and their struggles in a safe and compassionate environment. And we want all of our members to thrive. So please join us. There's no cost. It's free. And, uh, you know, if anybody feels like donating, we'd be much appreciated. we got a donate button on the, on the web page. 
And, uh, you know, every dollar goes to just helping this tiny train keep chugging along <laughs> and, uh, you know, try, trying to help people, uh, you know, get past the 27 Club. We don't want any more members of that. And if you are past it, we want you on your next birthday and the birthday after that. You know, we want you here. So join us. Thank you so much, Ace. In summary, Over the Bridge took tens of songs from individual artists from the 27 Club, fed those songs into an AI that then created a brand new song based on the musical content from the songs that it had been fed. They then fed a second AI all of the lyrical content from those songs to create a new set of lyrics. They then brought in a singer from a cover band to sing the lyrics and melody over the music. Finally, a mixing and mastering engineer brought everything together to create the final product. If you are working in any part of the music industry and need any sort of assistance with mental health or you would like to help others, please get in touch with Over the Bridge. You can find links in the video description or if you're on audio in the show notes.